Hello, my name is Gail Derzuski, and I'm the Director of Adult Education for St. Matthew's Catholic Church in San Antonio, Texas. Welcome to our ongoing presentation on the book of 2 Samuel of the Old Testament. Today we're going to go over chapter 7, which is a very important chapter when God makes a covenant with King David. But before we do that, let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. God, our Father, we thank you that you are a God who accompanies us, that no matter what happens, you are with us, that your promises are sure, and it may not be in our time, but it's always in your time, in the acceptable time. And give us the courage and the patience to wait for the fulfillment of your promises, either here on earth or forever in eternity. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Chapter 7 is considered the center and the focus of the entire narrative of King David, which began all the way in 1 Samuel and will be essentially completed by the end of the book of 2 Samuel, including his life as a whole and his powerful reign over all Israel. It is the highlight of Deuteronomic history because it is the theological heart and soul of the entire story of the monarchy as a system of governance for ancient Israel. The Deuteronomic historians structured Israel's history into three parts, beginning with the exodus and entry into the promised land in Deuteronomy and Joshua, continuing through the time of the judges in Judges and 1 Samuel, and concluding with the time of the monarchy in 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings, and concluding um, with the death of King David and then the very evil kings who came after him. 2 Samuel chapter 7 is at the apex of this theological history, and it triumphantly affirms King David's hold on Israel's leadership his rests from his enemies, the security of Israel in the promised land, and the divine promise of a dynasty that will endure forever. As David's just and righteous king, this chapter will provide the standards by which all of Israel's future kings will be judged. Most, if not all, will fail this standard. The Deuteronomic historian was likely writing during the dark times of Israel's Babylonian exile. And so the sacred author is looking back at King David. King David's life then becomes kind of a golden age, full of promise, hope, power, and prosperity. This chapter therefore urges the exiled Israelites to recall the extraordinary presence, the extraordinary promises of God of Israel to one man and his descendants, and exhorting the much diminished deportees to remember, admit their sins, and to return to God with the hope born from the extravagance of God's eternal loving kindness to his chosen people. The first 17 chapters of chapter 7 will also become the source of the messianic hope of Israel as it develops in the Old Testament messages delivered by the prophets and the psalmists. Yet Israel is never able to abide by the standards of chapter 7 of 2 Samuel. This hope will culminate in the Christian identification of Jesus Christ as the perfect fulfillment of Messiah, as the perfect fulfillment of the promises made to King David in this chapter. So God's covenant with King David is described in verses 1 through 17. In this passage, the, the word covenant is not used once. But there's no doubt that God intends to make a covenant with King David, the man after God's own heart. Let's have some general observations about this unique covenant so we can understand the importance of this chapter. First of all, God very much treasures this one man. This covenant is unilateral, irrevocable, and unconditional, with God doing all the promising. No obligations are placed on King David. The creator of the universe is unilaterally promising to protect and preserve the royal line of King David, a mere human being for all eternity, 
no matter what he or his descendants do. This is a truly astonishing gift from God, the king, who will never withdraw his love from this most human king, although the text acknowledges the reality of sin. King David and his descendants who sin will be punished and punished severely by God, but he will never withdraw his loving kindness, his hesed, from the line of King David as he did with King Saul in his line. The divine creator of the Eunice irrevocably commits himself to the human house of David. The grim narratives of the tragic cycle of rebellion, retribution, repentance, restoration, characterized by the book of Judges, definitively demonstrated that mere human beings are incapable of keeping up their end of any bargain with God. There's no point to a conditional covenant. God's covenant with David will therefore do away with the necessity of human reciprocity and compliance. It is God who will be obligated. It is God alone who will perform. Because this is truly an extravagant gift from God that cannot possibly be earned by a mere human king, these verses are often cited as the basis for the Protestant Reformation focus on salvation as a grace and an unmerited gift. And so the actual covenant begins in verses 1 through 3. King David is described as settled in a luxurious, well-appointed, well-fortified palace, finally at rest and secure from all his enemies. He has completed what Joshua could only begin, securing the land of Palestine for the Israelites. King David's regal status is now beyond doubt, and the once simple shepherd boy has now firmly become the shepherd over all Israel. He's living in a palace of cedar built by the finest craftsmen using the finest materials available. And so King David decides that now is the time to build an opulent house or temple in honor of his God, who is still living in a simple tent within the Ark of the Covenant. Now, temple building is part of the Near Eastern royal ideology of King David's time, with kings building lavish temples uh, to ensure continuing benevolence from the gods. A central sanctuary fulfills many critical roles in a royal theocracy, including bringing centralized order and standards of right worship, providing a tangible aspect of the divine presence, and assuring the people that the divine will always be encountered in the royal capital of the human king. It is indeed an act of piety to build a house for the Lord, but it also can be an act of self-serving legitimization. The Hebrew word for house, bayit, is used over 2,000 times in the Old Testament, and it can have several meanings as follows. It can simply be a residence for families, for the wealthy and the noble, it includes the entire estate. It can mean a temple built for gods and goddesses. It also can be a family unit, including future descendants. All of these meetings will be encompassed using the word house in chapter 7. So David again faithfully inquires of the Lord through his court prophet Nathan, who appears for the first time in this passage. Nathan will be the most important prophet advising King David during his reign and will continue to advise King David's successor, his son, King Solomon. Initially, Nathan agrees, yes, let's go ahead and build an opulent temple for the ark of God. That's an appropriate thing for you to do. However, God will quickly correct this misunderstanding that evening. The luxury of the proposed temple does not correspond with God's self-understanding, for he is a God who journeys amidst his people. The ark is a symbol of a God who is always in movement with his people, including the dangerous possibility that God may leave a sinful people, whereas the temple attempts to limit this dangerous possibility. However, the God of Israel is not a God who can be boxed in, domesticated, controlled, or manipulated by royal wealth and power. The God of Israel is a quintessential God of freedom, beginning with his mighty act of deliverance in the narrative of the Exodus. 
He does not need, nor does he want, a house built by human hands, a house that may give people the mistaken notion that mere human beings can limit his radical freedom. Even if a house were to be built for him, it'll be at his initiative, at a time, place, builder, and construction of his choice. Human royalty will not be permitted to make God as just another piece of fine furniture decorating the palace. King David's desire to build a fine house for God is, of course, a noble desire, a commendable desire. But God declines this honor because he has something far greater than a mere physical building in mind for this king. King David is interested in a construction project. The God of Israel is interested in people, for he is always infinitely greater than any of the plans that we can conceive of. And so in verses 4 through 17, God confronts Nathan at night and corrects Nathan's previous approval of King David's plan. The evening indicates that Nathan may have had a dream or a vision in which he is instructed to be God's messenger to the king with the words, thus says the Lord. Going forward in King David's reign, the prophet Nathan will continue to be the preferred mediator of divine declarations to this king. Although God does not appear directly to King David, the high calling of this human king is again emphasized by God calling him my servant David, a title King David humbly accepts. Only Moses and Joshua at the end of their lives are so titled by God in the Old Testament. This title, my, my servant David, indicates the great importance God attaches to this human king and the new thing that he has begun in human history with the Davidic royal dynasty. So God begins by asking several questions pertaining to this house King David wants to build. God essentially says, whose idea is this? And firmly retakes the initiative. It is God, not a human king, who will command anything concerning the right worship of God. God then rehearses his history uh, as a God who dwells among and with his people in a tent, a house. He is quite content with his tent. The Israelites have mistakenly presumed that they were carrying him on their tent poles, but it is God who has carried his chosen people from the time they left slavery in Egypt to this time. God then rehearses his personal history with King David, firmly stating that he was the one who selected David from the flocks to shepherd his people Israel. It is God who has been with David ever since, enabling all his military victories. And it is God who has chosen him to rule his people. God uses King David for this great responsibility because David has been faithful to God, not because of David's military or government capabilities, although he's indeed capable in both aspects. This is to be the model of royal theocracy in Israel going forward, with God the ruler and the faithful human king, a servant, only doing what God commands. This is a model that will not endure and indeed begins to collapse in David's own time. God then states his covenant with King David using the rare divine title, the Lord of Hosts. This is a very regal title that emphasizes God's attributes as king who is granting this covenant to his faithful servant and human king, David. The divine grant is in two parts, and each part clearly references God's covenant promise to the first and great patriarch of Israel, Abraham. And again, this highlights David's great importance in God's new plan of salvation. And so the two parts are as follows. First of all, there are promises to be realized after David's lifetime, and then there are promises to be realized after David's death. The promises to be realized during David's lifetime is that God will make King David's name great. He will provide a secure place for Israel and will permit the king to be secure and at rest from his enemies. The promise to make King David's name great echoes God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. 
The promise of a secure place for Israel also echoes God's promise to Abraham that his territory would extend from the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean Sea in Genesis chapter 15. This will not be a temporary resting place, but the Lord will firmly and permanently plant his people Israel in the land through his servant David, who will be given the victory over his enemies during his lifetime. And then there are promises that will be realized only after King David's death. Rather than a house built with physical materials by humans' hands, God will establish his house through the descendants, the human descendants of King David. House in this chapter especially has the sense of a royal dynasty. And so God will establish his presence with his people Israel through King David's royal offspring. A son of King David will always sit on the throne of the kingdom of Israel throughout all eternity, and God will watch over the sons of King David like a loving father watches over his children. God will love the sons of King David with a father's eternal love, essentially adopting them as his own sons. But he will also punish um, them for their wrongdoing as an earthly father confronts his children. The rod of the Lord's punishment will fall on the rebellious sons of King David, a rod of punishment that will eventually end in the destruction of Jerusalem, the end of the independent nation of Israel, and the exile to Babylon in 587 BC. In spite of all of this, God never stops loving his descendants of King David, no matter what they do. He will never stop looking after them. He will never withdraw his covenantal loving kindness, his hesed, from King David and his sons, as he did with King Saul. Indeed, God will extend these promises to the entire human race, far beyond the physical descendants of King David and even the nation of Israel. However, a physical house will be built one day for God in Jerusalem, but it will not be King David who will build it. It will be a future descendant. It is God who will determine who will build this physical house, not a mere human king. Like Abraham, these promises made through a son will only be fulfilled after David's death and he is laid to rest with his fathers. Although the son is not named here, it will be Solomon who will build the first temple of Jerusalem for the God of Israel. Other later biblical texts suggest that the reasons why King David will not build the first uh, temple is that he's too busy waging war with his enemies. And this is in 1 Kings chapter 5. That he's a warrior with too much blood on his hands to be able to build the temple. And, and that is in 1 Chronicles chapters 22 and 28. Although God uh, will not permit David to be the king who builds the temple, uh, David's enthusiasm for this project will never dim. Before he dies, he amasses much of the building materials that will be used by his son Solomon. Now, the Israelites will not experience the fulfillment of this promise through their future human kings because they will grievously sin against the God of Israel. The physical Davidian dynasty will end with the Babylonian invasion, deportation, and destruction in 587 BC, when Israel as an independent nation will cease to exist until the founding of the modern state of Israel in 1948. However, Christians trace this covenantal promise from David uh, from Abraham through King David to Jesus Christ, the only son of the Father and the quintessential good shepherd who will show the Father's love for his people all the way to his excruciating death on the cross for the salvation of all humanity. Now verses 18 through 29 are King David's prayer to God in response to these great promises. This is a formal prayer, not his usual way of having a conversation with his God. This prayer will be a unique combination of deference, doxology, and demand. King David enters the tent where the Ark of the Covenant is housed, and he sits down before the Lord. The normal posture before the Ark of the Covenant would be kneeling or lying prostrate, but it may be that sitting is a royal prerogative. 
King David begins his prayer with great humility and deference. He addresses God with another kingly title, Lord God. This is a title also used by Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. As if to further highlight his deference, King David repeatedly refers to himself as servant. The central theme of the prayer will be David's house. Although his family is still insignificant, King David expresses complete confidence that his family will become great in the future because a great God has promised that it will be King David's sons who will rule forever. King David gratefully acknowledges that it is enough that God has brought him and the chosen people this far. But according to God's great will and word, there is more to come. God's greatness and his great deeds on behalf of King David and his family overwhelms this human king with gratitude, who is driven to praise God extravagantly. For there is no other God like this God. The uniqueness of the God of Israel is a recurrent Old Testament theme, occurring in the Song of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2, noted by the prophet Samuel when he presents Saul to the people as their first king in 1 Samuel chapter 10, throughout the Psalms, especially Psalm 18, and throughout the messages of the later prophets to the people, Isaiah chapter 45, Hosea chapter 13. This unique God, who has no rivals, has redeemed his people and made a powerful name for himself by his great and awesome wonders on their behalf driving out all other gods and the enemies of his people. He has indeed been the matchless God of Israel, even condescending to become their God and Father forever. This unique God has chosen King David and his descendants as the future and eternal channel of his selection of Israel as his witnesses to all the nations. Going forward, this Old Testament understanding of the kingdom of God will be mediated through the kingdom of David and his dynasty. This is a promise that today's politicians, who have become very adept at manipulating the language of faith to gain votes, would die for. God's covenant with his chosen people will be established forever with King David's house. And then in verses 25 through 29, King David ends his prayer in humble and grateful deference and with audacious boldness also. He says, bless my dynasty, although the command is softened by the phrase, confirm the promise. Because it is the sovereign Lord who has made all of these promises, King David expresses absolute trust that all of them will be fulfilled. King David ends his lengthy prayer with a calm and contented assurance that the same God who has selected and protected him to this point will continue to do the same for his descendants. I want to thank you for joining us. Let's end with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. God, our Father, we thank you for your promises, and we will always rest confident and assured that you are a God who fulfills all your promises and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to thank Father Dennis Arechiga, the pastor, for his support of this endeavor. I also want to thank our many donors and sponsors who make this possible, Real Mission Media and the Rivera family for their expertise.